For those who don't know nothing about what's going on, this is for you. For those who are tired of being sick and tired and you want to get out of this world and go to a new heavenly place through the blood of Christ, I'm talking to you. If you are a sinner and you know you need help, I'm talking to you. Because all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. I'm talking to you. And those who want to do God's work, those who want to know more and know how to do God's work, this is for you, friend. Boot camp, day number two. It's right here, right now. Get your Bibles, get your pen, your paper, record. Take some good notes, and we're going to have a Bible study. Straight up Bible study, one-on-one. That's why I do it like this, because I wanted to, I wanted it to feel like it's one-on-one, that I'm in your house, wherever you are, and that we're actually we're just laying it out, studying the Word of God, going from Scripture to Scripture. Because don't you know, we are at the end of time. It is interesting that, you know, we've, we've, been, we've seen and, and experienced this election cycle with Hillary and Donald Trump. And, and you find here on Time magazine, they had, it appears that they have Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton holding a sign. And that sign is just interesting. It says, the end is near. And I said, wait a minute. And I know what they're talking about. They're talking about the the campaign, this whole campaign season. And and they're going to elect or select the president. And uh, But anyway, uh, Christians need to understand this. God is even speaking out. He's speaking out even here. He's letting us know if you know prophecy, you will clearly see that time, the end is near. It's not just talking about, yes, that's a Time magazine, but it's revealing to us, those who know Bible prophecy. It's revealing clearly. When you look at all the things that's going on today, and you put it all together, when you're studying Daniel, Revelation, you put it all together, that ain't lying. They ain't lying. The time, the end is near. And the question is, friend, are you ready? As I mentioned before, This is a time to get into the word of God like never before, friend. And if you're still into to the the Hollywood and all the the sports and all that stuff and you have to have your ESPN, you got to have your your cable network, your dish network, your Netflix, you're not going to make it. I mean, there's no way that you can hold on to the things of the world and actually hold on to the things of God. You can't have it both ways. You got to either let the world go. You got to let it all go all the way to get into the word of God. We can no longer waste God's time. Why waste God's time when there's work to do, friend? We have work. That's why we're putting this together, the Bible prophecy boot camp, so we can get in the word of God and study and find no truth for yourself. If you're depending on a denomination to lay out the truth for you and and, and do the work for you, you're going to be devastated because that's, that's not how it's going to happen. That's not the way the Bible describes it. The Bible says, study to show thyself approved unto God. The Bible tells you to go and to all the world. So we, th- there's no remote control Christians. We all must be involved in this work for such a time as this. So I am encouraging you. This is the reason why we call it a boot camp. Because we're, 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 we're developing soldiers. We're soldiers on the battlefield recognizing who our enemy is and the enemy of Satan and demons himself. And we must go out and save those who need to be saved. There's a lot of people who are wounded. They're hurting. They're dying as a result of the sin to the world. But God has a plan. It's called the plan of salvation to save all people. And God's and those who, are, who have cleaned to the truth of God's word. We are responsible as soldiers, as Marines in God's army to do this work. So it's time. Let's open up our Bible. Let's go to it, friend. Again, it's the Bible Prophecy Boot Camp and, uh, series. And this is day two, lesson number two. And just to let you know, we're going to be following. We're, the Bible is our textbook. This is your textbook, friend. King James Version. That's our textbook, the Holy Bible. And what we're using as our Bible study guide, our, our workbook, so to speak, is a book that we wrote. It's called The Forgotten Commandment and the Mark of the Beast Crisis because that's the main things we'll be focusing on in this particular boot camp. So we're looking at The Forgotten Commandment and the Mark of the Beast Crisis. Module 1, we're looking at, right, that's where we're on now, is The Forgotten Commandment. It's three lessons. We went over lesson number one yesterday or last 
program. Then module two is going to get real deep. We're going to be looking at the mark of the beast crisis. We're going to be looking at from lessons from Daniel Revelation. We're going to be identifying who the beast is, what the image of the beast is, and et cetera, et cetera. You need to know these things. And there's a lot of people who have no clue. And you may be one of them. And you want to know the truth. And I just want to read something here. Because it kind of set things up for today's boot camp. Like a rose that was dropped from a beautiful bouquet. A commandment has been forgotten. Which one is it? How does remembering this commandment help you to understand the difference between the mark of God and the mark of the beast? Whose mark will you receive? Today, God is pleading with you to receive his mark. God loves you, friend. and makes a way for you to be prepared for the global crisis that will occur right before the coming of Jesus Christ. Jesus is coming soon. The question is, are you ready? So if we continue our study, we, we're going to put this all together about the forgotten commandment. So the day is we're going to study lesson number two, remember the Sabbath day, part one. And you need to understand how this is connected to the mark of the beast crisis. Now, yesterday, or last study, we studied about the Ten Commandments, all ten. We saw that God, Jesus said himself, if you love me, keep my commandments. We saw that the commandments just reveal sin. It don't cleanse you from sin. Commandments point you to the, con- is used as a conversion tool to point you to Jesus Christ. It's a mirror that reveals sin. It's also a standard of righteousness in which we, standard of righteousness in which we are judged. But it also, again, points you to who? Jesus Christ, who cleanses you from sin. So the commandments don't make you keep the commandments. Jesus living in you, abiding in you, and when he is abiding in you, you will have a will to keep his commandments. Because remember, the commandments of God is spiritual. And we have carnal natures, fleshly natures. So I can't just keep it in myself, in my own strength, but only through Jesus Christ. But remember, again, it reveals what sin is. So thank God for the Ten Commandments. I need the Ten Commandments. And then we learn that the commandments of God is a direct reflection of the character of God. They reflect each other. So the Bible says that God is truth. Well, the Bible says the commandments are truth. God is holy. The commandments are holy. God is righteous. The commandments are righteous. We learned all that last program so we're going to have to go ahead and move on today and we're looking at the remember the sabbath day part one so i want you to perk up get your word of god as i mentioned before if you want to get the bible study god this particular book right here you can go online and download it for free way to peace.net and download it for free on a pdf or if you want to order it you can order it and get the physical copy also you can get a box of books so you can share it with others have a Bible study group yourself and use this as your guide. But anyway, we're going to get right into the word of God today. So let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we're excited again because you are God. You are in control of things. We don't have to be discombobulated of, the, of this particular election that just happened. We know who's in control. You are in control. So since you are in control, you're revealing to us your truth. And Lord, may we follow the truth. Give us clear understanding of your word as we study. For ourselves, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So again, friend, let's go. Are you ready? Are you ready? Again, remember the Sabbath day, part one. Now, which commandment of God's Ten Commandments have been forgotten, ignored, or rejected? Which one is it? Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt have all the gods before thee. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. You already know what it is. It's in the title. Let's go to Exodus 20, verse 8 through 11. Exodus 20, verses 8 through 11. And let's look at this seemingly forgotten commandment that it appears like the whole world is forgotten. And the Bible says, remember. It says what, everybody? Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shall I labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day of the Sabbath, the Lord thy God, in it thou shalt not do any work, 
thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, nor thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that's within our gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all them in the midst, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. So we see here clearly, the Bible is clear. It says what? Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Now, why did God say remember? Well, it's apparent that God never wanted us to forget. And so he tells us that all, all the Ten Commandments this is the only commandment that begins with the word remember. So it shows you the importance of it. And it also shows you that God it, did not want us to forget this commandment because it's extremely important. Just like all ten are important, but this is extremely important, especially if we find out when it comes to the Mark of the Beast crisis. And by the way, I just want to let you know, we're on chapter 2. This is what chapter we're on in the book, chapter 2, page 15. All right, so anyway, so let's go ahead and look at this. Let's look at this study. Let's get, let's get study. First of all, you need to understand, it says, remember the Sabbath day. Now, the word Sabbath in the Hebrew just simply means rest, okay? So we see here that God has given us a holy rest day. So let's go ahead and look at some more. So Sabbath in the Hebrew equals rest. Understand that. When was the seventh day Sabbath or the rest day established by God? Let's go to Genesis. Genesis chapter 2. I got it right here on the screen. Genesis chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. And this is what the Bible says. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the what, everybody? On the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had made. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because that in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made in Genesis 1 1 the Bible says in the beginning God created the heaven and earth on the first day he made light on the second day he made our our atmosphere on the third day he made our food the plants the trees and the flowers on the fourth day he made the sun the moon and stars on the fifth day he made the birds that fly in the sky and the fish that swim in the ocean in the waters and on the sixth day he made man he made animals and man and on the seventh day, as the Bible says, he rested. And did God rest because he's tired? No, God rested. He ceased from all his work of creating. And then he created a special day. Let's learn more about this special seventh day. Now, notice when we see in Genesis, instead of it using the word Sabbath, it uses the word rest. And the word rest in the Hebrew is Sabbath. And we saw, if we looked at in Exodus, the word that we saw in the fourth commandment, the Sabbath commandment, it used the word Sabbath, which means rest. But here in Genesis, it uses the word rest, which means Sabbath. And God reveals it a holy rest, a special rest. Amen. Now, based on what we just read, at the end of creation in Genesis 2, verses 1 through 3, there are three main things that God did on his creation. What are those three main things that God did on the seventh day, crea day of creation? Let's look at it. Number one, he did what, everybody? He rested. He, he Sabbathed. <laughs> he rested. Number two, he what? Blessed it. Blessed meaning special benefits that only God can give. And it's only given on that day. I hope you get it. And then it says he sanctified it. The word sanctified means is made for a holy purpose is sacred. In other words, it's set apart from the other six days. Remember in the commandments, it said six days shall thy labor. God loves work. He loves us to work. We should always remember God every single day. But God had a special day. He has a special day in which he rested in which we are to rest his Sabbath rest. And then he blessed it. Now, if I want to receive the blessing, I must sanctify it. In other words, I must keep it holy. That's what the Bible says. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. So if I want the blessing of that Sabbath in which God has a special blessing only on that day, not on Monday, not on, not on Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. This is a special day for that day. Yes, we worship God every day, but that day has that special blessing that God has given. He didn't bless any other day of the week. He said they were good. I hope you understand that. You look at the scriptures, all those things, all those days were good. He did something good. He created, it was good. Created man, it was very good. But when it came to the Sabbath, it was blessed. 
I hope y'all got it. <laughs> I hope you got it. Now, let's, let's move on. Now, what does a Sabbath specifically commemorate? Word commemorate means a, a, as a memorial. So we can remember. What does it specifically commemorate as a memorial? Let's go to Exodus chapter 31. And we're going to look at verses 16 and 17. Exodus chapter 31, verses 16 and 17. I hope you're with me, soldiers, because it's boot camp. So boot camps are for who? Soldiers. Amen. They don't make no excuses. They don't have no manby pamby excuses. They want to know. They want to learn. They want to be on a battlefield giving the truth. They want to know the truth for themselves so they can give the truth. Amen. So let's go. And like I said, it doesn't matter what denomination you're with. If you're with a denomination, you ain't had to be with a denomination. I'm going to tell you in the very end, it ain't going to be about a denomination. Because all our denomination, our modern world has failed. I'm just being straight with you. All of them. We need to know the word of God for ourselves. Amen. Let's go to Exodus chapter 31, verse 16 and 17. Wherefore, the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations for a what? A perpetual covenant. Don't miss it now. A covenant is a contract. So this Sabbath is a perpetual covenant. In verse 17, it is a sign. Is it what everybody? It is a sign. And the word sign in the Hebrew literally is a mark. It's a memorial. Hope y'all got it. It's a sign or a memorial between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth. And on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. So you see here. That the seventh day Sabbath is a sacred time to commemorate, don't miss it everybody, to commemorate God as your creator and savior. It's a day to remember that Jesus is your creator and savior and redeemer. He is the one that established a special day so you and I can remember who he is. Even in our hectic lives, we should always stop and remember. In other words, the Sabbath is like an anniversary. Now, anniversary is a special day for two married people. And it just comes usually once a year. And when it comes that year, you, that every once a year, the, the couple, they usually celebrate it as a commemoration of that marriage they had together. See, and you can't change that. Nobody can change that. It's special. But what, you, what God has done, he's given us an anniversary every single week to remind us of our, our relationship our relationship with each other, that we shall have this special commune time with each other. Amen. So it's a special holy day to commune with God, a special cathedral of time so we can recommit ourselves to him, to renew our commitment on this day of memorial. That's what it is. So God didn't tell us to put up a monument. To remember, he didn't tell us to go put out a, a physical stone monument of whatever image to remember God as our creator. He didn't tell us to put a, 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 some type of man holding up the world to remember God as our creator. No, he said, I want you to stop all your work. And on the seventh day, I want you to rest and be and receive the blessing. Keep it holy. And we have this special commune time. That's how God said, I want you to remember it. Amen. So also understand that since the Sabbath points to the creator and it points to creation, it is tangible proof that God exists. It is tangible proof that God is real. So let's go ahead and look at it again. Since the Sabbath points to creation and the creator, God, it is tangible proof that God exists. Now let's look at it, Romans 120. For the invisible things of him from creation of the world are seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power, the Godhead. So they are without what is what everybody? Excuse. The creation of the world are clearly seen. Man, they're trying their best to discredit the word of God. They're trying their best to discredit the creation of whole creation six days God created and on the seventh day he rested they're trying their best to give us evolution they're trying to give all these excuses but God revealed look at all the integral things that 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 creation has given us 
through the hand of God, through the mouth of God. Man can't duplicate it. When you understand mitosis, meiosis, cell division itself, that'll blow your mind how you came into this world. Man can't even, they, 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 just, they just know it's happening. They see it's happening, but they sure enough can't explain why it's happening because God put it all together. Amen. So God, he is that eternal power that has given us creation. And God says, I've made the seventh day as a special day for us. Now, what does the Bible say about Jesus as our creator and savior? And I want to give you some Bible text proof that Jesus, who is divine, because just by the way, again, the name Jesus means Jehovah is our savior or Jehovah saves. And the word Jehovah simply means Lord, self-existing one meaning it has divine power. So the name Jesus itself is divine power to let you know he is part of the Godhead. Amen? And he is the one that actually was the active agent in creation. Because remember, the Bible says, let us make man in our image. So we see that Jesus is at part of that us. And let's go to John 1, 1 through 3, and then verse 14. That's John 1, 1 through 3, and then verse 14. 14. Let's look at that. The Bible says in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. And the same was in the beginning with God. All were made by him and without him was not anything made that was made. Then we're going to skip to verse 14. And what does it say? What does it say? And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the father, full of grace and truth. And who is that word that became flesh? It was no other than Jesus Christ himself, revealing here clearly that Jesus is not only our savior, but Jesus is clearly our creator. Let's look at more evidence here. Colossians 1, 14 and 17. In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, who in the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature, For by him were all things created. What's it say? For by him, what? Were all things created that are in heaven and that are in the earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him for him. For he is before all things and by him all things consist. So he clearly, clear again, see clearly. Verse 14 made it very clear through his blood, and that's only Jesus Christ. And again, it reveals that Jesus is divine, friend. Ephesians 3, 9. Look at three, Ephesians 3, 9. And let's see what it says. And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world have been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. More Bible evidence, friend. So we know, especially we have two or more witnesses from the word, you know this truth is so. And we can take that to the bank. Amen. Now, which day is the seventh day of the week? Which day is the seventh day of the week that God rested and blessed? Now, if God tells us to remember, and God told, told us, That he rested that day. God told us that he blessed that day. God said he sanctified and made holy that day. Now, do you think God will make it clear what day it is? Now, it made clear. It's very clear. It's a seventh day. All right. So now we need to know which day is a seventh day. Now, most people, if you just look at the calendar, just count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And it shows you what day is a seventh day. And it's clear. (laughs) Let's do the math, everybody. And this is from a standard calendar, and it's the standard calendar, and uh, the first day of the week. And I'm going to show you some Bible proof, too. But the first day of the week is Sunday. The last day of the week is Saturday. You count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. That seventh will will fall on Saturday. So it's clear that the Saturday is the seventh day of the week, according to any standard calendar and the dictionary itself, a standard dictionary. And, um, and many other proofs out there to prove that Saturday is the seventh day. Now, some people say, well, didn't the calendar change? Or, or this? We're, we're going to get there. We're going we're to talk about that, all right? 
We're going to talk about it, but just, just look at your regular calendar, and we're going to show you some proof in the Bible. And we're going to also show you and make it very clear uh, where, the, first of all, notice something. When you go to Genesis, it, it didn't say on, a, on Sunday God made light. It didn't say on Monday God made the firmament, and, he, and then on Tuesday he made. It didn't say that. It said the first day of the week. So notice God didn't make the, he didn't name the days anyway. All right. See, during creation, God did not name the days. He numbered them one through what? Seven. In which the seventh day being a special day, that holy rest day, that Sabbath day, that Sabbath rest day. The names of each day that we have today were actually added. And where it comes from? It came from the pagan cultures. It came from the Greeks and the Romans. And they're the one, because the Greeks and the pagans, they worship the heavenly bodies. They worship the false gods. They didn't worship the true God of heaven. And they made up these, had these imaginary gods that they named, and they attached it to the, to the various planets. And they thought they had powers. And they thought they were, it, but they didn't because they're not, they didn't exist. They weren't real. But they put names to it. So when they had the sun, that was, a, that was the biggest god that they served the sun they worship the sun so that was the first day of the week because that's a day that all the pagans came together to worship the sun it was the highest day of the week so they call that sunday and then the second day they call it monday because they worship the moon the moon god and then on tuesday they worship the mars the mars god and on wednesday they worship mercury god on thursday was jupiter on friday was venus and on saturday it was saturn that's how they get the names. All those names of those planets actually came from the Re- Greeks and the Romans, mainly the Romans. They, they, that's where those planet names came from. And then they attached those planet names as their gods to the days. And that, on, that, on that first day of the week, that special day of the week to them was Sunday. All right, so let's look it up. Study it yourself. And you see in history clearly that the first day of the week is Sunday. And the last day of the week is Saturday. And it's been that way one through seven from the beginning of time. So how does the New Testament confirm that the Holy Sabbath is the seventh day of the week? So here we go. Saturday. How can we confirm this now? Now let's go ahead and explore some text at the time of Christ's death on the cross and resurrection from the tomb. Christ died, notice, Christ died on the sixth day of the week, which is Friday, which is known as, to the Jews, it was known as Preparation Day. It was a day before the seventh day Sabbath began. So we're going to see that. I want you also to notice here, Jesus died on Passover. And it was clear that Passover at that time fell on that Preparation Day, the sixth day of the week. And Jesus died on Passover, and Jesus is the Passover. He was a Passover lamb that died for the sins of the world. Jesus actually fulfilled the Passover feast on the preparation day, the sixth day before the Sabbath day. But let's see here. Let's go to John 19, verses 31 through 33. And it says, the Jews, therefore, because it was what? The preparation, meaning the preparation day, that the body should not remain on the cross on the Sabbath day. For that Sabbath day was a high day because the Sabbath day that was coming up was known as the Feast of Unleavened Bread in which it fell on the Sabbath when the Feast of Unleavened Bread actually fell on the actual Sabbath day which was coming in. The sun was about to go down and we'll talk about that in a little bit. The Sabbath was about to begin and they knew the Jews who were killing Christ who were breaking the commandments they didn't want to break the commandment. They didn't want to break the seventh day Sabbath commandment, but they were killing Christ, had Christ killed. They want to make sure he was dead or had him make sure he's dead on the preparation day before the Sabbath because it's going to be a high Sabbath. They besought Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might, bro- might be taken away. Then came the soldiers to break the legs of the first and the other, which was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus, they saw that he was dead already. They break not his legs. All right, there you go. So Jesus died on Passover. He died on preparation day. He didn't die on the Sabbath. He didn't die on 
Wednesday. He didn't die on Thursday. He died on a preparation day. And what actually gave it more credence that their t- movement, that that was preparation day, it said that the, that the, the next day was a high Sabbath. And when you look at the history of, if you understand the feast day, see the feast days, if you look back and study it in the book of Leviticus, you'll see that the high Sabbath, any time that the Feast Unleavened Bread actually fell on the Sabbath, it was known as a high Sabbath. So we already know clearly that Jesus died on that Friday, that preparation day. Now the women, the women who prepared the body of Jesus rested on the seventh day Sabbath. Let's go to Luke 23, 53 through 56. Let's look at that quick, real quick. And he took it down and wrapped it in linen and laid it in a sepulcher. And it was hewn in a stone, wherein never man laid before. So they took his body and prepared to put him in a tomb, Jesus' body. In verse 54, and the day was preparation day. That's, remember, that's the day he died. But the Sabbath drew on. So he died the preparation day, but then the Sabbath came. And it says in verse 5, and the women also which came unto him from Galilee, followed after and beheld the sepulcher, which is a grave. And now his body was laid. And they returned and prepared spices and, oint- and ointments and rested. They did what, everybody? They rested the Sabbath day according to the commandment. What commandment is that? It's the fourth commandment in which we're never to forget. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. So we see clearly the sixth day Friday before the Sabbath is known as preparation day to prepare for the Holy Sabbath. Now, so we got that clear. So Jesus died on a Friday. Just, he rested his tomb on Sabbath. And you see here clearly that the, that the women who were preparing the spices, they also rested that Sabbath. And then we find out in Mark 16, 2 and 9, that Jesus rose early on the first day of the week, Sunday. He rose early on the first day of the week, Sunday. Look at Mark 16, 2 and 9. Mark 16, 2 and 9. And very early on the morning, and very early in the morning, the what everybody? First day of the week came up, came unto the sepulcher at the rising of the sun. And then skip on to verse 9. And now when Jesus was risen early the first day of the week, he appeared to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he was cast out seven devils. So the first day of the week is clearly Sunday. And matter of fact, there are some denominational uh, traditions that say that they celebrate Sunday because Jesus rose from the grave on Sunday, the first day of the week. And I'm going to just prove this on and on and on that the first day of the week is Sunday. So the first day of the week is Sunday, and that's clearly revealed. All you got to do is count one through seven, and you come up clearly that the seventh day of the week is Saturday. Now, some people say, oh, but, but, but how, you even, how can you confirm that? How can you be sure that the calendar didn't change? Now, remember, 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 friend. God's not going to let this special day that he gave us from creation, even after sin, get lost. Because if it was special before sin came into the existence because notice that sab the sabbath was created at creation even before sin even entered this world the sabbath came bef- uh, before there was any jews in this world so we're gonna learn some more about that <laughs> okay we're gonna learn some more about that so let's go ahead and continue to let's go ahead and continue to study friend all right Again, in summary, Jesus died on the sixth day, Friday. He rested in his tomb during the seventh day, Sabbath, Saturday, then rose from the tomb early the first day of the week, Sunday. So let's go ahead. Is there other proof that the seventh day of the week is the Bible Sabbath? And I hope you get this, friend. Got to make sure I look into this camera here. I hope you catch it, all right? Is there any other proof that the seventh day of the week is is the Bible Sabbath. Now, this should get you excited right here. Now, first of all, understand this. The descendants of Abraham, Jews have been around for almost how long? 4,000 years, and it's never lost track of the seven-day weekly cycle. All right, so you got that. They never lost track of it. They've been around for years. Now, remember, the Sabbath is not just for the Jews, but they 
have, they never lost track. And still to this day, there are many Jews that keep the Sabbath. And they know when the Sabbath begins. They know it's on the seventh day. And it's Saturday. Second proof number two, everybody. And this should really kind of get you up out of your seat. Again, you need to know these things for these last days. The Sabbath is found in the names of over 100 languages to represent the seventh day of the week, Saturday. Did you know that, friend? Did you know that? This is amazing right here. This is amazing. For example, the word for the seventh day of the week in Spanish is sabado, which means Sabbath. So in Spanish, in Spanish, Exodus 28 says, remember, I'm just saying the English word, the sabado to keep it holy. See, I don't know much about, I don't know Spanish that well, but I know sabado means Saturday in Spanish, which is Sabbath. It means Sabbath. Now, in the French, the French word for the seventh day or Saturday is Sabbati, is Samini, which means Sabbath. In Italian, it's Sabato, which means Sabbath. In Russia, it's Sabata, which means Sabbath. And they use it for the word Saturday, all of them. Can't you see it? It is awesome. Jesus says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, a special day to commemorate with God. But I'm going to show you something that's going to that's going to blow your mind. I said over 100 languages, over 100 languages, proof that the seventh day, Saturday is a Sabbath. Here it is, everybody. And this is some examples right here in the Greek. The Saturday, the word for Saturday is Sabbaton, which means Sabbath in Portuguese. Portuguese, Portuguese is Sabado, just like Spanish, which means Saturday. Uh, get some more example in Poland is Sabata, which means Sabbath in their word. They're talking about the Saturday, but they still call it today. Sabata, which means Sabbath. What's that tell you, friend? And his gospel was when, when, when the disciples were the, who were the apostles of Christ after Jesus died, they didn't go around saying that the Sabbath changed anything else. They kept preaching the word of truth, the commandments of God throughout all the earth. The world was turned upside down and they gave the truth and the word world were following the Sabbath is evident that they were keeping the Sabbath because look at some other languages again in Africa, in Rome, in Bulgaria, in Bohemia, in Malay, in, A in Arabic, Ethiopian. And the list goes on and on in Persia. They use a word for Saturday to say Sabbath, which means Sabbath. It reveals as evidence that they kept the Sabbath. But Satan, he came in and he discombobulated things where people got confused because they weren't studying for themselves. They didn't stay true to God's word. Now, when does the seventh day Sabbath officially begin? So we got it. It, it, is, it is clear that the seventh day is Saturday. And the main thing is, friend, what do you want to follow? Do you want to follow what the man is saying? Or do you want to follow what the Bible is saying in these last days? Which way are you going to go? And that's what God is asking all of us. Because I'm just showing you Bible proof. See, it's my job as a minister of God is just to reveal and show you what the Bible is saying. And then what your job is to do, go back, study it for yourself, and to make sure these things are so. And if these things are so, clearly, what are you going to do? Again, are you going to follow what the Bible says or follow, what, or follow what man says? And I know for me, I'm just saying for me, I'm following what the Bible says. What are you going to do? So when does, when does a seven-day Sabbath officially begin? You just need to know this, friend. Now, this is the creator's clock. And one thing you may not know, or you may know, let me just ask you a question. How do we get our year? How do we get our year? Our year is gotten from the earth revolving around the sun. One complete ro uh, revol revolution around the sun. It takes 365 days, and that's known as a year. Now, how do we get our months, friend? We got our months with the moon going around or revolving around the earth. 
And one complete ro- re- revolution is known as a month. And it takes approximately 30 days for that to happen. Now, let me ask you a question. So how do we, so we know about this, the, the earth going around the sun to get our year, the moon going around the earth to get our month. So how do we get a seven-day week cycle? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. It's not determined by the earth going around the sun. It's not determined by the moon going around the earth. I'm going to tell you how you get it, friend. The Bible. It's the Bible. Jesus, God himself gave us a seven-day week cycle. Man have tried to change it before. They tried. Ten-day week. Why don't we have a ten-day week cycle? Why, if, if people who are atheists, why don't you just change? They, they can't change it. They will never change it because God is in control of it. See, God is in control of time. God created the time. God created a seven-day week cycle. And it's in the Bible, another proof that God is real, friend. So don't let other people try, man, man who are, who are puny compared to the knowledge of God, trying to tell you and I that God don't exist, trying to tell you and I you came from an ape, trying to tell you and I that the, the, don't, don't, don't worry about the, those seven-day week cycle. No, it came from God, friend. Even atheists follow a seven-day week cycle, not knowing it actually came from the Bible. God gave it to us, and he gave it to us for a reason. As a special day. You know Exodus 20 verse 11. It says it in the ten commandments. The fourth commandment. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth. The sea and all that in them is. And rested on the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the seventh day and hallowed it. So this whole seven day week cycle came from God himself. So the question again is. When does the day begin? When does the Sabbath begin? We know it's Saturday, but when does it officially begin? Well, you may not know this, and I'm just following what the Bible says. It doesn't begin at 12 o'clock midnight. Yeah, I know. I know some people are like, what do you mean? Doesn't the whole day begin at 12 o'clock midnight? First of all, think about it, friend. Did God make Adam and Eve with a watch? So how can they actually bring in a new day and they dead sleep at 12 o'clock midnight? So God never set it up where a new day begins at 12 o'clock midnight. That came from man, all right? Man put that together at 12 o'clock midnight. So when does a day actually begin? A day begin. Let's go go back to creation so we can find out, all right? Let's go to Genesis 1-5. That's how at the very beginning, that's where God made light, right? God made light. Everything was dark, then God made light. And God said, And then after the light was made, God called the light day and the darkness he called what? Night. And the evening and the morning was the first day. Evening just basically means dusk. When the sun is going down or when it's starting to get dark. All right. Because here God didn't have the the sun made yet. But that's when it starts to get dark. That's known as evening. So the evening and the morning was the first day. Now notice after he made our atmosphere. After he made our firmament in the heavens, the sky. And it says in verse 8. And God called the firmament heaven, and the evening and the morning was a second day. So you notice again, evening and morning is a second day. So when did the day begin on that second day? It began in the evening. You're still awake usually when the sun is actually going down or when it's starting to get dark, in which you can actually bring in a new day. But notice, it's the, this, this pattern continues. At creation, Genesis 1.13, and the evening after God made all our food, made, the, made all the plants and all that good stuff and vegetation, the trees, it says in Genesis 1.13, in the evening and the morning were the what, everybody? Third day. And then verse 19, after he made the sun, the moon, and the stars, it said, in the evening and the morning was a fourth day. And then after he made the birds and the fish, in verse 23, it said, the evening and the morning was a fifth day. And then, after he made animals and man, in verse 31, and God said everything that he made, and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. So you see the pattern, everybody? So when does the day begin? It begins in the evening. And if the reason why God did this, the reason why he actually gave us in the text evening and morning, First day, evening and morning, second day. So we can see that it's literal days. 
we can see that this is not a, a, a it took millions of years on the first day that God made. You think it's going to take millions of years for God to make light on the first day or thousands of years for God to make uh, trees and all these other things? No, God made these things in 24 hour literal days from evening to evening is a 24 hour literal day. So when does a day begin? The day begins at dusk in the evening. That's when it begins. Evening equals the dusk, the night, or sunset. I mean, that's what it is. When the sun is setting or when it's getting dark, the evening has begun. So in other words, when you see the evening coming in, notice you're actually welcoming in a new day. Amen? But again, remember, evening to evening is 24 literal hours. You can calculate that. You can see, so God made this world in 24 literal hours, six days, in which on the seventh day, he rested. So when does the Sabbath begin? Now, we know the Sabbath is the seventh day of the week. We know it is Saturday. But based on the Bible, I'm going by the Bible, the Bible only, all right? That's the promise. We're going only by what the word of God says. The seventh day Sabbath officially begins on Begins on at sunset. It begins when? At sunset on Friday and ends at sunset on Saturday. So it begins uh, that new day as that preparation day. We preparing for the Sabbath. And when that sun goes down, the evening begins. We welcome in a Sabbath day. Amen. And when the sun goes down that next evening on Saturday, we welcome in a new week. And the Sabbath is officially over. And we look forward to the next Sabbath. Amen. Because we know we received a blessing during the Sabbath that we actually kept holy. Now, another question. We're starting to wind down this plan and we're going to continue on uh, next time. But I'm just going to start wrapping it up. Have there been calendar changes that change the seven day weeks, weekly cycle? And this is where a lot of people get all, oh, this calendar change, the calendar change, I told you. The calendar, so how do we know which day we, God, God would never let his, this special day go. Would you, do you ever forget your birthday? No. Would you forget your anniversary? I hope not. <laughs> but anyway, for those who are married, have there been calendar changes that changed the seven day week cycles? The answer is no. The only changes that, that changes or never change in the seven, seven day weekly cycle itself. The only change that had nothing to do with the seven day week cycle was in October 15, 18, October 5th, October. It was in October 1582. Ten days was removed for the Congorian calendar in order to keep up with the solar cycle. Now, do you think that God would allow a special and important blessing such as a Holy Seventh-day Sabbath be lost by man. Just ask yourself that question. God's telling us to remember. He's telling us how special it is. Do you think even though in our, in our sinfulness and how much we may or may not believe in God, do you think God's going to allow that to be lost? Of course not. Of course not. Now, what did Jesus do on the Seventh-day Sabbath? What did Jesus do? On the seventh day Sabbath. Well, let's look at Luke 4, 16. The Bible says, and he, talking about Jesus, came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And, and, and as his custom was, what did he do, everybody? He went into the synagogue, that's the church, on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. So it's clearly that this was part of his custom. This is what he did every Sabbath. Luke four thirty one, and came down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee and taught them on the Sabbath days. Now, the question I'm going to ask you is, whose example are you going to follow? You can follow what man is saying. You can follow what the Bible is saying. You can follow what Jesus is doing. That the Bible says in 1 Peter 2, 21, for even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye may, that ye should follow his steps. So whose example should we follow, friend? Whose example? We should be following the example of Jesus. Amen. First John 2, 6 says, he that saith he abideth in, abideth in him. Talking about if you abide in Jesus, abide in Christ, ought himself also to walk even as he walked. 
So if Jesus kept the Sabbath and he tells us to remember the Sabbath, we should also do what Jesus does. Amen. That's what we should do. It's that simple. Now, what day did the apostles and the early church worship on after the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ? Now, do you think all the apostles would know if the Sabbath changed? Do you think they lost the significance of the Sabbath? Of course not. Now, Jesus dies and resurrects. He didn't say, well, I'm going to change the Sabbath. They kept on preaching the truth from the word of God as it is. And they remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy and taught others to remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Let's look at Acts 13, 14 and 15, friend, and see what the Bible says. But when they departed from Perga, Perga, they came to Antioch and Pesteza and went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day. They went into the synagogue when, which is a church, on the Sabbath day and sat down. And after the reading, the law and the prophets and the rulers of the synagogue sent unto them, saying, Ye men and brethren, if ye have any word of exhortation for the people, say on. But notice again, it says, what were they reading, everybody? They were reading the law and the prophets. They were reading the, the law, the word of God, the commandments of God, and the testimonies about the Messiah. So they, did not, they didn't say, well, friend, we're reading the law, but God's law has changed because Jesus resurrected. It didn't say that, friend. They read it, they kept it, because it continues on. Verse, let's skip on down to verse 42. Skip on down to verse 42. It's Acts 13, verse 42. And when the Jews were gone out of the synagogue, and the Gentiles besought that these words might be preached unto them the next Sabbath, the Gentiles will let you know this wasn't just for the Jews. The Gentiles said, man, we want, we want that word. We don't want to know about that law. We don't know what the prophets are saying. We want to know what the, what, what the word is saying. We want, we want to know more about the Messiah. And he said, okay, well, they came to him that next Sabbath. And now when the congregation was broken up, many of the Jews and the religious proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who were speaking to them, persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. And the next Sabbath day came almost the whole city together to hear the word of God. There it is, friend. There it is, friend. I hope you got it. I hope you got lesson two on this boot camp, the Bible prophecy boot camp. And I'm going to tell you, friend, you need to understand this, this, this foundational study about the Ten Commandments and the Sabbath. We'll continue on. We're not done with it yet. We'll go on with day two, lesson number three. This, remember the Sabbath day, lesson number three. That's going to be next time. But uh, you want to make sure, if you don't understand this basic truth, again, friend, you can see where we are in the stream of time. You, you, can, you can ask some, you, you just go to anybody on the street, just ask somebody, man, do you think we're living in the last days? Most people are going to say yes, because everybody sees something's going on. But we need to understand this foundation here. Because if we don't understand this foundation here about the Ten Commandments and the Seventh Day Sabbath, there is no way you understand the beast, the image of the beast, and the mark of the beast crisis. So I pray that you got a clear understanding of God's holy day. It's a blessed day, friend. It's a special day. Because it's coming at a time when you're either going to worship a God's holy Seventh Day Sabbath or a man-made counterfeit. Because when it comes boil, when it boils down to it, friend, the seventh-day Sabbath is all about who you worship. And, and, and God makes it very clear. Remember, the seventh-day Sabbath is a memorial. It's to commemorate God. It's a sign that you and God are totally connected. It's a sign that you are connected to the true God in heaven. And that you don't, you, you're, not, you're not concerned with what other people think about you. You're only concerned about pleasing God. And I pray, friend, that's your attitude now. That's, your, that's the kind of character you want to have now and develop now. Not trying to please people and you really care about what other people say. Because remember, and this gospel should be preaching to all the world as a witness to all nations. The gospel that will set people free. The gospel that is, is, that is filled with truth to set people free. But the vain is to understand God said it himself. That this gospel that will set people free from sin that is truth will prick the hearts and minds of all people and you either do one or two things you either submit to the truth and be converted to the truth and follow the truth and be con 
persecuted because you're following the truth because no, because it's, it, it's, it's not popular. And it doesn't feed the flesh. So you're either going to be, a, be persecuted or it's going to prick your heart and you fight against the truth. And you fight those who are following the truth. That's persecutor. So you're going to either be a perse- persecuted or a persecutor. You're either going to worship the truth or worship what's false. And the only way you know what's true, you need to, know, you need to study the truth in these last days. So I'm, fran- I, that, that it, I'm praying. I'm praying that people will wake up. And that's the reason why we're doing this boot camp. That people will wake up. Because it's going to get deeper and deeper. We've got to go through the basics first. But as you, as you study, pray to God to give you clear understanding. Pray to have a connection like you never had before. Pray that you can detach yourself through the power of Jesus Christ from the world. Because it's going to take divine, inspir- the divine uh, intervention. Because we got to let the Netflix go. I'm, I'm sorry, friend. I'm not sorry. I'm not really not sorry. And you need to go throughout your house. I mean, literally. As we continue to study as, as a soldier, if you're a true blue soldier, true for Christ, there are some demonic spirits you got to get out of your house. You need to go and look at your CD collection. You need to go and look at your DVD collection. And if you know it's not uplifting Christ in any way, if you know if it's mixing the world and the church, you know you need to let it go because God says you need to be free. You need to have no more distractions, even in your Facebook. If you know you have friends just putting down foolishness, unfriend them, friend. You need to put your mind in an atmosphere of truth in these last days. Studying the word of God like you never did before. Turn off your ESPN. Turn off your HBO. Turn off your Showtime. Just turn off your cable. Cut it all together because friend you are not going to make it if you're in this if you're not in this word because i know people are saying well do i need to know prophecy do i really need to understand daniel revelation as it relates to the sabbath do i need to new new all need to all know all those things i just want to know jesus i just want you can't know jesus unless you can have a deep relationship with christ if i don't even learn all the things of christ and, 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 and i know it's baby steps i know you 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 start with the the milk, the sincere milk, but we must grow up into the fullness of Christ. So I must go from the milk to the full course meal. And the thing is, friend, there's a lot of people that's been in church for 30, 40 years and still drinking on milk and telling people, well, I don't really need to understand those things in Daniel Revelation. I don't need to really teach those things. Yes, you do. Because the only way we can make it in these last days, we didn't know what Christ is doing, but Christ is revealing to us clearly what Satan is doing. And if you don't know what Satan is doing, you're going to be, you're going to be side-swiped. And that's the reason why, again, we don't need to be all upset about this election. Why are you all upset? Because either way it went, is it, you're going to vote for worse or worse. I mean, I'm just telling I'm being straight. And they both, both. I'm going to fulfill what's going to fulfill prophecy. It's going to happen, friend. And if you understand, and so you, you need to understand what's going on. And that's the reason why I'm, you need to watch the next program. We're going to continue to study on the Sabbath. Two more studies on the Sabbath. Then we're going to move on to the next part. We're going to be moving on to the next part. And we're going to get into the market of the beast crisis. And you will see that we are, we are literally, it's right upon us. And you need to know this truth. I pray that you learn something today, and I hope you get excited. I'm excited. Jesus is coming again, and I just pray that you get excited too. I pray that you let somebody else. I pray that you share this video. Share, share, share. That's something you can do. You can do that off the back. You just hit the button. Share. Share it to everybody else. Share it to your family. Share it to your friends. So they need to know this truth in the last days for themselves. They need to study for themselves. They need to get on the battlefield because this is this is this is it, friend. Let us pray. Dear Father, Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the truth. We ask you, Lord, to lead and guide us to all truth, Lord. I am praying that you be with every single person that's studying with us right now, that's studying the word of God. They are no longer looking to what the other people, they're not looking for answers from other, other areas. They're looking for answers from the word of God. They're looking for truth in these last days. And we're praying that your Holy Spirit will move upon their heart and mind in such a way to assure them that, they, that they're following truth. To assure them that this is the way, the truth, and the life. 
through the blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, Lord, we're praying. We're praying that people accept the truth of your Sabbath and that we'll continue to study. And not only pray about the, the understanding the truth of your Sabbath, but keep it holy. Oh, Lord, we got much, much more to learn on the subject. So teach us, we pray. In Jesus' holy name, amen. Well, God bless you, friend. Until next time, we'll see you again on, on the next Bible Prophecy Bootcamp.